Well, a very good morning to you, a very good afternoon, or for some of you, it's a very good evening. So wherever you are listening to this presentation today, live um, at International Coach Week 2021, my name's Natalie Ashdown from Open Door Coaching, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here today to listen to a really fabulous keynote speaker. I'm really looking forward to just sitting back and enjoying uh, everything that our speaker has to share with us today. So on behalf of um, Synergy Global, uh, I hope you've really had a wonderful um, coach week so far and we're looking forward to um, sharing this presentation with you this morning. So uh, today I'd like to introduce you to John O'Millen, uh, Jonathan Millen, I call him, we call him Jono. Um, he's a wonderful coach, he's a wonderful leader with experience in uh, learning and development through a number of organisations, leading coaching and leading cultural change within organisations. And uh, Jono did our certificate for quite some time ago now and has, has really um, uh, done a lot to implement coaching within organizations. Uh, today, he's here to talk to us about the advice trap, which I'm sure all of us at some time can fall into. But when we're coaching managers to coach people, it's a big topic we have to think about. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet today and acknowledge elders and their continuing connection to the land, waters and communities of Australia. And we pay our respects to them and to their elders past, present and emerging and to anyone who might be on the line today from an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent. And we extend our acknowledgement out to anyone who might be an Indigenous person from the country that you are dialing in from today. So as I mentioned, wonderful opportunity to sit back and learn from an extremely experienced um, learning and development manager, uh, John O'Millen, uh, and also a wonderful coach um, and a person who um, just gives so much back to us as well. So John, o, thank you so much for joining us. I, as I mentioned, ready to sit back, listen. Um, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, everyone, oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, if, you, um, if you would like to uh, talk to us or um, ask questions, um, add your commentary, please pop that into the chat box. Uh, just note their panellists and attendees so that we can all see it. And if you're here because you'd also like to get your CCEU, your ICF professional development points, um, hang on the line uh, when we're finished and I will put that up for you as a screenshot. So that's our admin out of the way too. Over to you, Jono. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Thank you very much, Natalie, and it's uh, wonderful to, to be here in, uh, uh, for we coaches. This week's a fantastic week for all of us as we, we stop and take some time out to uh, focus on our own professional development and uh, hear from uh, lots of other people. So I'm sure many of the people that are joining, joining us here this morning have been part of uh, the International Coaching Week in, in some way, shape or form. And uh, uh, my role here today is, is to uh, pass on a little bit uh, around some of the work that I've been doing from a coaching perspective uh, in a most recent role, which I'll get to in, in, in just a moment, uh, uh, that's really designed to help you to uh, think about the types of conversations that, uh, that, that you have as a leader, uh, as well as uh, the, the approach that you're taking it and, and becoming very conscious about the situation in which uh, you're going to be uh, finding yourselves uh, in. Uh, so it's, it's fantastic to be here. And uh, if I could just start by thanking Natalie for, uh, for, for having me, it's, uh, as Natalie said, uh, I think it was about 2008 that, um, that I went through the coaching program. And just prior to that, uh, I started in my first first role as a people leader at, at the National Australia Bank in uh, in the year 2005. Uh, and for many of you, you uh, or even some of you here today, you may have even been promoted from uh, an individual contributor or a specialist in a team into leading that particular team. And that was certainly the case from, from my perspective. And for the first two years, it was really about understanding uh, people. We needed to make sure that we were doing what we were doing uh, and executing what I needed to do uh, and I was leading a learning and development team who was facilitating and designing programs uh, for that uh, for that organization and during during that time I went to uh, my very first uh, let's call it leadership 101 program and uh, at that point 
the uh, we were taught to uh, empower our team members and go and tell them uh, what to do when uh, when you've been there whilst applying some leadership type practices. Now, uh, in theory, that was that, that was all well and good, and and yet the statistics over the next two years were, upon reflection, uh, weren't exactly great. And when I say stats, it was I was leading a team of seven people, and for the next two years, I lost half my team. So that was three one year and four for the next, and uh, they cited uh, they needed a new opportunity or they wanted to to build and uh, and explore something different. And it was, really wasn't until uh, I had my first exposure to coaching in 2008 uh, and into 2009 uh, and working with Natalie and team at the Open Door Coaching Group that uh, I came across this concept called coaching. And uh, since that time, it's, uh, I've gone through a couple of programs that, uh, that have been run through Open Door and done some other study and, and applied it in, in my role uh, in organisational development and learning and learning and development. And that's really what we're going to talk about uh, here today. Uh, because going from team member to team leader is something that uh, some of you have been through, or you might even be leading or coaching some people that uh, that have gone from team member to to team leader. So, so my role here today is is um, to, to to work through and, and talk to you about uh, what I call the advice trap. And this is some work that I've been doing uh, in my most recent role at uh, at Medibank. Uh, I actually left there about uh, about ten days ago. Uh, to and I'm now working with uh, Tabcorp in a senior capability uh, role, where I'm really excited to be to to be introducing and building a coaching approach uh, across the leaders, amongst other things, uh, within this organisation. So. So my role here today is, is working with you uh, and, of course, within Tabcorp going forward as leaders to help them move from uh, what's typically an advice-driven approach to very much a curiosity-led and partnering approach. Uh, so uh, many organisations are actually promoting their leaders from team members uh, to leaders of that team. Uh, and think about your own history. You may have even experienced that too. So the reality is that... Uh, what's got them uh, or individuals to that leadership point is not actually going to get them to the next point. Uh, and, and what I've found in working with, with these, uh, these leaders and certainly senior leaders is that by actually stopping and taking some time and being curious a little longer really does help you to become a, a much better coach. And for those of you that are leaders, uh, become an even better leaders. So today, uh, imagine that you're, you're a people leader uh, and you've been promoted from a team member uh, of that same team, or if you're a, uh, a, a you're currently a, a leader, as we go through this, I want you to consider your own approach to to leadership because I'm sure you will find some uh, some interesting points as we go through this. So this session today aims to provide you with uh, the confidence. Uh, and some greater capability to, to really proactively embrace what I call a performance partnering process with direct reports. Uh, and for those of you that are pure coaches, uh, then it's, it's around how do you partner with them uh, to, to help them see the best opportunities uh, to help motivate them, develop them, engage them, and align uh, and effectively manage team members' performance. Because regardless of of the organisation you're in, performance is always something that's constantly being being assessed. So it's about leading team members so that ultimately they're willing to own the process. Uh, they're willing to execute their own responsibilities with clarity uh, and dedication, and they don't always need us as leaders jumping in and actually telling them what to do. Uh, so we'll talk about this a little bit a little bit further. So here's what I am to cover today, and that that is to uh, provide you with a methodology. To to determine the most appropriate conversation type. Because as leaders, there are times where we need to move in and out of having a coaching conversation. There are also times where we actually need to perhaps take our coaching hat off uh, and actually provide some feedback, uh, provide some advice depending on the tenure of that particular person in the, in the team. And we, we take perhaps more of a traditional, perhaps mentoring uh, and certainly managerial role. But there's a time and a place to be able to move in and out of these types of conversations. So today is really about an opportunity for you to see performance partnering uh, uh, is a term you'll hear me use a little bit today because whether you're a leader to a direct report, it's a partnership. It's not always one down. It's not me, the leader, telling you what to do. 
all the time. Uh, and it's certainly not uh, about HR told me that I need to uh, have this conversation with you. So I'm actually going to do coaching to you. Uh, it's certainly not about that. Uh, so we'll build your coaching capability. Uh, this session is going to enable you to have a more effective conversation with team members or even, even coachees. And uh, longer term, it's uh, as long as you're, you're prepared to take some time out and invest in your own skills, the savings and time uh, and effort in terms of what you're doing will start to pay dividends. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into this and uh, let's start with just a common understanding or background very quickly of, of why, why coaching and, and what is coaching. Now, in my, in my time at Medibank, uh, this, is, this is part of a, uh, a leadership development program that, uh, that I rolled out there. And uh, some of you, you wouldn't be surprised by this. So companies have used professional coaching for business reasons and have an average return on their investment in coaching of around seven times their initial investment. And this is according to a study that was commissioned by the ICF uh, and conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers. House and in my role, uh, I rolled this uh, elements of this program out to the top 150 leaders within, within Medibank. And on average, 76% of the leaders that went through this program reported a increased ability to coach for action that actually resulted in the person that they were coaching leading to action and improving their particular performance. So to my point before around performance partnering, the role of a leader is very much to partner with their direct reports, stay curious longer to help them achieve what they need to do. So for the purpose of this, let me define coaching purely in terms of uh, a one-on-one -on -one conversation that, uh, that you might have as a leader with a direct report. So in a nutshell, coaching is an activity that takes place between a coach and a coachee, or in this case, a coachee is a direct report that provides a safe, valuable and reflective time away from the demands of an often reactive doing based workplace to concentrate on their own development. So in other words, coaching allows the coachee time to think and to have their thinking expanded and therefore able to perform much better. So if you're a leader, just think about perhaps one of the last one or two conversations that you've had with the direct report. How did it happen? Were you fully present in that conversation? You might have had something that was on, something that was pressing, a deadline, and someone's come up to you and asked a question. Uh, what was your response? Was it quicker and easier just to tell them what you think that they should do? Or did you stop, perhaps ask them to come back a little later where you've got some time? Uh, or did you actually take some time out and reshuffle your diary to, to work on what's going on? Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. And a reflective question for you is, have you received advice from someone in the last week or two? Now, let's just get a little bit interactive here. What I'd like you to do is go to the chat box and... What I'd like you to do is just give me a simple yes or no. Have you received advice from someone in the last week or two? Okay. So let's explore this a little bit further. Many of you have. All right, and again, I'll be keen for your thoughts. So again, Type away your responses to this in the, in the chat box. Were they solving the wrong problem? So you may have asked for it. You may have asked for some advice or you've sought some counsel of somebody. Were they solving the wrong problem? Okay, some are saying yes, some are saying no. All right, so think about that scenario. Okay, secondly, were they proposing a mediocre solution? Again, hit the, hit the chat box. Were they proposing a mediocre solution? All right. Okay, and final question before I add some, add some further points. Think about how you felt when that person provided you, you some advice. Did you feel empowered or engaged to take action? So 
Okay, so frustrated and annoyed and not valued. All right, thanks, Michelle. That's uh, that's typically a response that people will get. So again, if you're a, if you're an individual contributor, a specialist, or even if you're a leader of leaders, and your leader uh, responds by basically telling you what to do, then that's typically how uh, how it makes you feel unsupported, perhaps undervalued, and even and over a period of time, this can lead to disengagement. So the trap that many managers fall into is where they think the best way to enhance performance is to oversee the discrete actions and decisions for every task that a report delivers. And this is typical approach of those people that go from perhaps individual contributor or team member into a leader of that team. Hey, and guess what? Did I do this when I was uh, first promoted from team member to team leader? Absolutely. And to my stats before, around half the team uh, disappearing over the next two, two years, uh, the problem wasn't necessarily them, it was me. All right, so, um, we call this the advice trap, uh, and, and and it's often referred to as managing people as opposed to leading people. Uh, it's also referred to as telling some. It may even blur the lines of mentoring, so it may not uh, be supportive for your direct report or the coachee, and it's certainly time consuming for we as as people leaders. And this is because we have to deal with each task separately all the time. Okay, now when I was at Medibank, I saw some stats some time ago about general practitioners. On average, they will interrupt their patient within the first 17 seconds of a conversation. And I always thought, well, that actually gives GPs a bit of a bad name because I think it's human. I think it's that most of us uh, interrupt people within around about, say, 20 seconds. That might even be pushing it. Uh, and we often go, okay, I get it. Uh, let me tell you what I think we should do here. And that's typically the approach uh, as leaders. So it's not just doctors, it's not just general practitioners. And it's a very human thing to go, look, I'm trying to help and I'm feeling the pressure of time. I've got an answer that's showing up in my head right away. And I think the best way of being helpful is to tell you that solution that I've come up with in my head. And it, uh, it might be uh, just not yet, just slow it down. Uh, and I really encourage you to stop when you, and be very conscious of when you find yourself falling into this advice trap and staying curious a little bit longer. Now, let's, uh, let's refer to this is some of you may have heard of Michael Bungay Stania, who's an Australian who's living currently in, the, uh, uh, in, in Toronto. And he's written this book called The Advice Trap. Uh, and this is, this is where I've got some of this content from. So I'd encourage you to, if you haven't seen this book, uh, is you, can, you can Google Michael Bungay Stania. Uh, I would highly recommend this book, particularly uh, if you're a leader or even if you're, you're a coach, because there's some wonderful tips, which I'm going to share with you here today, that I've actually delivered to leaders across Medibank that really does help to, uh, to set the scene. And I'm going to read, read a part of this in just a moment. And that is, uh, this quote here, I think, is brilliant. It's, it turns out curiosity is a superpower. And if you think of yourselves as a, as a coach and a leader, if you can just stay curious that little bit longer and hold off jumping in, it increases engagement and impact. It's kryptonite, or it's polar opposite to this, is the advice monster. Now, to my questions before around, have you received advice from someone in the last week or two? Okay, so now you know what it feels like to be told what to do, potentially, or given the particular response. Now, all things being equal, there are certainly times where, where you need, you just need to know the answer because you just don't know what you don't know. Uh, and yet, over time, if you take more of a coaching approach, to delivering what you're doing, then you'll actually be able to shift the behavior of the individuals in your team. So you know what it now feels like, and you're probably thinking about a scenario where someone's given you some advice recently. I now want you just to flip your thinking and think about a conversation that you've had with someone in the last week or two, where someone's come to you and said, how do I? What do you think? Uh, what are your thoughts on? And your response has been st jumping straight into what's called the advice trap. And for all the reasons I outlined a moment ago, where time's tight, you're not quite sure, you think you know what the answer is, and it's just easy to give you the give the person the answer that they want. 
you're not always solving the wrong, uh, the right uh, uh, issue or or problem. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read part of this just to help to uh, reinforce uh, the concept around why your advice does not work. And this has come directly from the advice trap from Michael Bungo Stania. Here we go. Okay, sure, it works some of the time. You, you've likely given well-considered and useful advice to someone in the last day or two, but your advice works less well and more often than you think for two immediate reasons. One, you're solving the wrong problem. That is, more often than not, you're offering up insights and solutions, brilliant or not, to the wrong problem. You've been suckered into believing that the first challenge that's mentioned is the real challenge. It really is. Be uh, but because we're all twitchy keen to help and primed to get into action, we love to jump in and solve the first thing that shows up, even when it's not the actual thing that needs to be figured out. At this very moment, throughout your organisation, people are working hard on non-critical issues because leaders haven't stayed curious long enough to find out the real challenge. Rushing in to give advice is wasting money and resources, energy and life. Secondly, you're proposing a mediocre solution. Let's say you sidestep that first mistake and you find yourself working on the right challenge. You've taken a little time to figure out what really needs to be solved rather than trying to fix the first issue that was mentioned. Well done you. Now, unfortunately, you're not offering up a range of not nearly as good as you think they are solutions. There are reasons why your ideas are often not that great. To start with, you don't have the full picture. You've got a few facts and a delightful collection of baggage, a robust serving of opinion and an ocean of assumption. You think you understand what's happening. Your brain is designed to find patterns and make connections that reassure you that you know what's going on. Trust me, you don't. What you've got is one part truth and about six parts conjecture. And... Uh, add, to the, add to that your own self-serving bias, which is what behavioural scientists call it, when you're over-inclined to believe your ideas are excellent. No wonder you're so willing to offer up opinions. Each one is a nugget of gold. You probably think you're driving, your driving's above average too. All right, so let me pause, pause right there. Okay, so there's uh, some further information around uh, why providing advice doesn't always work. So as a, as a leader, there are times where we need to consider the approach at the appropriate point in time. So staying curious longer, many of you would be familiar with the GROW model, and this is, an, and I will reference this in, in just a moment. Staying curious longer by exploring what's going on for the individual is something that uh, leaders can do much, much more of. And in relation to the GROW model, it's understanding that person's reality uh, and being comfortable to explore what's going on for them at that particular point in time. As a leader, there are going to be times where you need to actually play the role of coach and ask some really good questions and help them lead to action. And I think back to a, a quote, I think from, from Natalie and team uh, early on when I went through uh, Open Doors program was, unless you leave the coachee in action, coaching has not happened. Now, assuming that you've got the time and you're making the time to be able to have that conversation, there are times as a leader where you will coach people, you will even, uh, you may even need to provide some advice because particularly if you've got someone that's brand new to the role, uh, they don't know what they don't know. They are unconsciously incompetent. And our role as leaders is to stop and take some time out to enable them to explore what and explore with them what they do know, what they don't know, so that you can help them shape and come to a decision uh, and an agreed a, a way forward. So as a leader, there are times where we need to have what's called a push or a uh, pull conversation. And you could be having many of these throughout, uh, throughout a typical conversation with someone. So you might be thinking, what exactly is a push or a pull conversation? Well, let me explore uh, and share this a little bit further with you. So um, a push conversation is sometimes as a leader, what's, uh, what's called for is taking a position uh, that's offering advice respectfully. It could be challenging some assumptions. It could even be providing some feedback because as people leaders, 
We need to provide feedback effectively to help improve performance. Pulling is more akin or more alike to coaching, and that's unlocking people's potential. Uh, and for those of you that have experienced uh, ICF coaches, uh, part of the ICF definition around what coaching is around helping to unlock people's potential, helping people to learn rather than teaching them. Uh, and as a leader, that's a much better approach because you get much more engagement uh, and, and uh, growth and performance from your team members. So there's actually value in both approaches, yet under pressure, what do we usually lean on? Again, let's go to the chat box. Do we tend to push or do we tend to pull? Hit the chat box, type away. Yeah, we do. That's right. So when a conversation is ambiguous or unclear, we tend to lean on the push approach. And whilst the push, push approach is not wrong, in fact, there are times where it's right. When used in the right context for maximum impact, we need to be aware that pull a pull conversation will help bring out the thinking and behaviours more fully. So this is ultimately going to aid the learning and growth of the coachee uh, or, your, or your direct report. And that's what you want to do. So I often say to leaders, you need to invest time to actually slow the pace down, be present with your team members, stay curious for longer so that you can explore what's going on for them, not you, for them. Uh, it's not about you. Okay, so um, a performance partnering conversation should double back and forth between push and pull across each stage of the process. And it should be a two way, hence partnering. And that's the role that we, that, that we really take. So the direct report uh, or your coachee is focusing on their goals, their development and their performance. The manager, whilst accountability is important, the focus in the conversation is around the thinking of the, the direct report. In other words, the job of the leader or the coach is to improve performance by improving that person's metacognitive ability. And that is the ability for them to consistently think about the situation and ultimately come to a point where they're actually providing you with uh, a way forward. Uh, and this is how performance is, is truly, uh, truly improved. Okay, so let's add this a little bit, uh, add some further to this. So what exactly is a push conversation? Now, if you have a look at your, your um, the screen in, in front of you, uh, you'll see this, uh, this, uh, this graph, a uh, graphic. And let's focus on the, the, the bottom right-hand side of that, uh, of that square, is if you're pushing all the time, you are solving someone else's problem for them. And this will come in the form of telling, instructing, giving advice, offering guidance, giving feedback, making suggestions, okay? So again, think about uh, conversations you've had with people. How many times have you done this? Uh, have I done this in the last week? Absolutely. It's, it depends on, on the right time, the right approach. Uh, is it the right way to do it? This session, this helps you to become more conscious about the approach that you're taking with people so that you can help them lead to uh, perhaps greater performance. So let's shift and go over, the, over to the top left-hand corner around a pool conversation. That's around helping someone to solve their own problem. Now, for those of you that, uh, that are leaders and you apply a coaching approach, is how many times you've had someone just come up to you out of the blue, uh, whether it be face-to-face -face in the office now that we're returning to that, or they just pick up the phone or you get an instant message and they suddenly launch into the issue. Uh, you could stop and say, okay, hang on a second, let's just go back, what's the purpose or what's the goal here? You could do that. In my experience, and for you to stay curious longer, I'd really encourage you to think about what you do at this particular point. It's quite critical because new coaches will often go, okay, let's, I need to follow the grow model. So I need to get to G and I need to understand what the goal is here before I go into the reality uh, options and a way forward. So staying curious longer, that person has come to you in uh, a certain state uh, or frame of mind their reality is right in front of you right now. I'd encourage you to stay very much in that reality and explore it further until it's fully exhausted before you then shift the conversation back to 
asking them something like, so what is it that you're looking to achieve? And that'll take you straight back to the goal to actually understand the purpose. Because often where there's conflict or there's misinformation or there's a lack of clarity, uh, this will come out in, in the reality phase. And once you've actually explored that further, you can actually come back and help them take the level of the conversation to a higher point to understand what the purpose is, what they want to achieve uh, so that they can then find a way forward. All right, so in summary, stay in the reality, then explore that person's goal or whatever it is they're looking to achieve, and then encourage them to come, come up with some options and a, and a way forward. And this is certainly going to do this if you take a uh, more of a pull approach. And this is around asking questions that raise awareness. In other words, what's going on for you? Summarizing is another great way of being able to uh, summarize the person's conversation that they've actually just shared with you. So I've noticed, I've heard you just say uh, that uh, are the typical types of questions that you might ask at that point. Uh, you might paraphrase. You might even re reflect on what's going on, okay? So uh, it's okay to pause and come back a little later and reflect on, on whatever it is that's, uh, that's ultimately happening. It's also around listening to understand. Okay, so uh, listen, explore what's going on for that person uh, before you move on. Okay, so ask yourself, is there a default uh, that you have? Do you typically push or do you pull? Do you do a combination of both? All right, so let's uh, just explore this uh, a, a little bit further. So I'm just, I'm going to re reference the, um, uh, the GROW model in, in, in just, a, uh, just a moment. So the GROW model is very much a conversational model and therefore it's, it's about a two-way exchange of information and it contains a mix of inquiring and giving views. In other words, um, uh, asking and telling, that is a push and a pull conversation. And because our definition, definition of coaching is about exploring the potential of an individual to achieve their own goals, the types of questions we need to ask uh, need to be open genuinely curious, respectful, and similarly, the view that we want to offer as a leader or as, as coaches needs to be expressed with clarity and certainly based on fact. So if it's an opinion or a character assessment that's being offered, it needs to be done very tentatively and to be open to, uh, to, to discussions. Okay, so most um, skilled salespeople understand the importance of open and expansive questions. And quite simply, they get more information from the speaker uh, when they ask questions that start with what, how, tell me about, describe, talk to me about, uh, and it's usually followed by silence. So if you ask uh, one question directly followed by another, the direct report or the coachee has less time to think and may shut down. So open and expansive questions are particularly, particularly important. You may have noticed there that I actually haven't shared with you a question that starts with why. Let's go to the chat box again. What is it about why questions? What about why? Why is also open. So head to the chat box. Why should we be cautious about asking why questions? Yeah, all right, so people feel judged when they answer. Thanks, uh, Alexandra, you're spot on. A coachee can definitely become defensive, all right? So again, I'm emphasizing this a little bit here, but if I respond to you as if you were my direct report and said, why did you do that? Why did it fail? Why did that uh, mistake happen? Of course, it creates a very defensive position that's very, very difficult to get out of uh, uh, as a leader. And the coach or your direct report becomes totally defensive around that. So really consider the types of questions that you're asking and start with, with who, what, how, uh, tell me more, uh, because they can be much better ways and rephrasing your questions um, to get a better reaction from them. Uh, and a more appropriate one. So paraphrasing and summarizing, as I said before, is an example of a pull type conversation. So in the form of both, um, both questions and statement, paraphrasing and summarizing, it's, it's important for the uh, that the coaching knows that they're being heard. So for those of you that are familiar with the ICF 
core competencies. You'll notice that listening plays uh, has a very strong theme through this. So if you're paraphrasing, you're actually allowing the individual that you're talking to uh, to, to actually understand that you are hearing their words and you're actually reflecting them back to them so that they, uh, they know that they're being heard. So a succinct summary or paraphrase uh, can often lead people to perhaps even rephrase what they're, what they're saying. They may even add a little bit more so that they can uh, express themselves uh, a little bit further. So permission questions. Permission questions give the coach some measure of control. They offer respect to the coachee and ultimately allow for, for clarity of the conversation. And it's important that as a coach or a manager that we can help direct the conversation as well. You may need to dig a little bit, little bit deeper on some areas, even sensitive areas, as, uh, uh, as well as being able to change subjects where we can. Okay, so examples of that might be, uh, you've mentioned X, Y, or Z. I'd first like to ask you about why. Is that okay? All right, so that's about how you, that's how you can actually seek permission. Because often people, particularly if they're in a heightened state of uh, emotion, may share a lot with you. And being able to focus on one of those at a time, or even asking them, what is it that you'd like to discuss here today? And then it becomes all about, about them. You may even have heard yourself using this type of question. I've used this quite a bit with my direct reports is, do you mind if I dig, dig a little bit deeper there? Can I ask you a challenging question? Uh, all right, so uh, can often be other ones. All right, uh, and finally, offering observations. So this is where we move purely into a push situation. So as coaches, you've oft you often need to share your own point of view. Uh, and certainly as leaders, we need to be able to share our observations, our insights. Uh, sometimes we may even be, need to be direct with them, particularly if performance uh, is not at the standard that we need to. So in keeping with the objective of making uh, actions, direct report or coachee owned, uh, the way we offer advice or tell is critical. So clear, objective and respectful observations keep the conversation safe. So as a leader and a coach, Rapport is vitally important. And I often say to people that uh, uh, building trust or creating rapport takes a lifetime of work. It takes a fraction of a second to lose if you say something that could be quite controversial or conflict directly with, uh, with, with that person's values. So to do that, uh, I'll often say things like, may I share my observations with you? Uh, particularly if the behavior itself is not uh, at a level that we would expect, uh, I've used this one before, and that's the behavior that I've noticed is, the impact is. Uh, so stating the behavior followed by the impact is vitally important here because it enables you to have what's called a fact-based conversation, not speculating or uh, making comments like, oh, other people have told me that you have or you might have, or I'm just getting this feeling that this is happening. Uh, what that's doing is, is that has the potential to break rapport and trust. So uh, one of the pieces of, of um, uh, takeaways from this session here today is stay curious longer, articulate the behavior that you've noticed, state the impact, and here's your choice. Uh, ask the individual their thoughts and see where they're coming from. Then you're actually, uh, you're pulling the response from them. If the behavior is inappropriate, you may need to say to them, uh, after you've shared your, your uh, what you've noticed and the impact, what your expectations are, okay? So focus on the, you're actually focusing on the person, not the issue. And uh, it's vitally important here that that's, uh, that's the approach that you take. Uh, so really to summarize this piece around push and pull coaching, what you're doing here is you're actually focusing purely on the person. So if you imagine a triangle where the arrow is pointing up, imagine you are the people leader at the top of that triangle or the coach. If you head down to the bottom uh, left-hand side, you've got the person that you're actually coaching and uh, or the direct, the direct report. Down the other side, down the left-hand side, you've actually got the issue. What a lot of leaders uh, or managers fall into the trap of doing, and this is where the advice trap comes into play, is they will head straight down and just focus purely on the issue. 
rather than heading down the other side of the triangle and focusing on the person and actually staying curious, asking some great questions and getting them to focus on the issue. So if you can actually think of that visual uh, triangle, focus on the person, not the issue, then that will help you stay curious longer, have better conversations with them and help them find a way forward to resolving whatever the actual issue is. Okay, so there we go. Uh, so let's have a look at when to have a push and pull conversation. Uh, what can be very, very useful here is the skill versus will matrix. And this can really help determine because some of you might be sitting here thinking, well, when do I actually need to have a push or a pull conversation? When do I need to have a conversation that might incorporate both parts of this? Well, this can be really useful. So often as leaders, being able to stop and focus on our direct reports and team members and actually finding out uh, uh, and looking at where they're at in terms of their experience, their tenure in the role, and perhaps their attitude and engagement going forward, it can be useful uh, to determine what type of conversations you intend to have by placing uh, and considering uh, where the person would fit within this matrix. And some of you may very well have seen this. You'll find heaps of content online and in books around this one. So post today, uh, take this away, get your cameras out, take a photograph of, uh, of this particular slide, have a look at it. Uh, and based on the push or pull model, how would you approach your conversation with your team members? So do you have team members in, uh, that might have very high skill and very high will? So therefore, you may need to spend more time stretching them. And that's where a coaching approach can, can really uh, uh, pay uh, dividends. You might have someone else that's, uh, that's in the team that is very new uh, and they, they may be, or they could be in the role for quite some, some period of time and they're not prepared to advance uh, their skills or knowledge in a particular way and you might need to direct them more. So you might need to take more of a push approach with them. Uh, uh, so consider your approach with this, find out where your people are, uh, place them in the uh, high or low end of this skill will matrix. Uh, and this will really help you then to consider the approach that you're going to take. Am I going to take more of a push or a pull approach to get the best from them so that you can stretch, inspire, or guide those people to advance and improve their performance? Okay. Oh, there we go, computer's a little bit slow. All right, so let's, um, so we've talked about, um, you know, why, co why coaching, we've talked about push versus pull, a little bit around skill versus will, uh, and how to have a, uh, a, a pull conversation, then uh, most of you would be familiar with this. And uh, think about the next conversation that you, that you have with your team members is to, uh, if you're going to have a pull conversation, that is asking some great questions of them and really encouraging them and to, to come up with uh, uh, the, the way forward. Most of you would be familiar with this approach. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is is this, and again, what I'd uh, what I'd encourage you to do is get your cameras out, take a photograph of this if you like, because here are some questions that I've developed that that are designed for leader of leaders, uh, and here's some example questions that you might consider using when you're having a development conversation with uh, one of your direct reports, and by all means, adapt this. Uh, so I'd encourage you to, to again get your cameras out, take a photo of this slide. You might find it useful. Uh, and uh, you can apply this. But what you can see here is, is that this, particularly in my work with, with leader of leaders, is they don't always have awareness of what it is that they're doing. And particularly if they've got deep subject matter expertise and knowledge of the area in which they're in, they tend to fall into the advice trap. Uh, and uh, as a coach or a leader of, of these people, then asking these questions can really help them to... Uh, understand what the possible impact is that they're having on those people that they're actually working with. And you'll notice that these questions here uh, are designed to really get them to, to stop, reflect, uh, and consider the impact that their leadership is having on those that they're actually working with. All right. So some useful hints and tips there. 
Okay, so uh, we're at about um, we've got a little bit over ten minutes to, to go. Uh, what what I'm keen to do is to um, just before we, we, we finish off here is I'll just finish with one 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 quick story story for you uh, that's around helping to stay curious for longer. So about twelve months ago, uh, probably a little bit longer now, back in when was it February March, we all experienced this thing called a pandemic. And I'm based in Melbourne, and a lot of us got shut down for a long period of time. Uh, as a leader. The, uh, I was looking in my library for the how to lead through a global pandemic handbook. And guess what? There wasn't one. Uh, and it was an incredibly challenging period for, for a lot of different people. Uh, I had people in my team that were either living by themselves in a small one bedroom apartment. I had parents. I had some uh, people uh, in, in between and we all faced our own challenges. My wife and I, with our daughter, we, we were constantly going in and out of uh, homeschooling versus work and then in and out, in and out. And it was really quite, uh, quite disruptive. One of the things that really helped me through, through this period in leading my team of seven uh, was we went from fortnightly team meetings where we'd come together for about an hour to talk about all sorts of different things. Uh, and often there was a standard agenda that was in place that started with something like checking in with individuals, uh, talking about updates from the leadership team, passing on information, maybe getting some insights and thoughts on, on, on a way forward and, and agreeing actions. We'd summarise, take notes, send out the minutes of the meeting or have them captured and off we'd go. And this is the sort of thing that would happen fortnight after fortnight. Now, when it came to, to the pandemic, connection was vitally important. Uh, and as a leader, it was, it was particularly important to actually understand uh, and empathise with each of my team members and their specific situations. So what I did was, was shifted those fortnightly one hour conversations and changed them to daily stand-ups or check-ins that went for no more than 15 minutes every day at midday. And there was just one question I asked each of them uh, because it was vital for me to stay curious, not just for the first time, but entirely throughout the, uh, the pandemic. And that question that I asked them was this, what's on your mind? It's as simple as that. What's on your mind? And I tell you what, the engagement of the team, which was uh, when we did the previous engagement score, the engagements were still pretty good around about 85, 86%. We spent pretty much 12 months through this pandemic uh, period. And when the survey was done again, I was actually really shocked by this, is that this, pl played, this approach played perhaps one of the, the, the greatest shifts I've seen in the engagement in the team where the engagement score was then recorded at 93%. Uh, and this is because when I sought some feedback from members of the team, they said, I just cannot wait to get together, talk with uh, our team members uh, and just share what's on my mind. Uh, at 12 o'clock. Uh, and this became the standard same question every time that we checked in. And we explored all sorts of things. We explored the highs of people. We explored their deep lows. The, their well-being uh, uh, was, was something that came up consistently. So what it enabled me to do was actually tap in with those individuals post this conversation uh, as a team and actually explore to ensure that their well-being was, was being heard. Uh, I'd listened to and there was a way that we could work through it because it was tough uh, and spending most of your day on Zoom calls and things like that, it really, really difficult that had an impact on, on wellbeing. So we were able to shift and change uh, to best manage the situation as we possibly could. And it all happened through staying curious for longer by asking that question, what's on your mind? Uh, so there you go. So the point of the story there is, is to stay curious, uh, ask those types of questions, and uh, one final tip for you is, is when you do ask these questions, uh, don't be afraid of the silence. Uh, and I often use a term with leaders. I use this term, wait for eight. So you might ask, what's on your mind? Then wait for eight seconds. Uh, it might sound like an, uh, an eternity, but for those people that are reflective learners or somewhat more introverted, it's really important that they have the space to be able to think before they respond. 
your extroverts, they'll come back to you pretty quickly. Uh, you, you know that. Uh, and yet being able to focus on that is, is really good. It gives them a chance to think uh, and explore what's going on. So uh, some fantastic outcomes that have happened from, from, from that. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to uh, just check in with each of you. It's, uh, we've talked through quite a few different things today around push-pull conversations, when to provide advice, when, when not. Uh, so think about that going, going forward. And uh, if you can head to the chat box, if you like, um, what's been most useful for, for you uh, in this session here today? Right, some fantastic responses there. We've got wait for eight, solving the wrong problem, focusing on the person, not the issue. Yes, yeah, stay curious for longer. It's not easy, but you don't have to worry, but don't feel as though that you're under pressure to fill the space uh, or fill the silence. You're actually giving that person time to think. All right, good stuff. All right, there's some great responses there. So for those that didn't catch it, I really encourage you to check this book out, The Advice Trap by Michael Bungay Stanier. He's a very funny guy. Just Google him. I think his company's called Box of Crayons. Uh, and uh, you'll hear him talk about this um, uh, a lot more than what I've shared with you today. But uh, hopefully today has given you some insight in terms of how you can pitch the, the idea of the trap that we can often fall into as leaders uh, and perhaps taking more of a management or telling approach rather than eliciting what it is that's going on and not falling into that uh, advice trap. Uh, so thank you, Natalie, for uh, having me along uh, here this morning. Happy International Coaching Week, everyone. And uh, I'm happy to stay on the line uh, if anybody has any questions or anything like that. So I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Jono. I have just... I've just really just enjoyed listening to you and recounting some of the real pure basics, but also updating my, uh, updating a couple of my mental models around stay curious for longer. Um, I've written down heaps of notes. So I really appreciate you just taking us back to the beginning and I enjoyed your definition of coaching and then moving us all the way through. I think it's a really good masterclass in terms of thinking about the basics. A lot of experienced coaches I know fall into the advice trap. So even as an experienced coach, it's good to go back and, and think about what you've what you shared today. So thank you for your time, um, Jono. Thank you for taking time out in the first week of your new role as well. I meant to mention that as well. It's, it's really um, wonderful. You've also given us um, a, a, a bit of a gift. So I'll drop that into the chat box too. Uh, Jono has put together a file. So if you'd like to download this file of some of the key thoughts that he has offered today you can pick that up I'm just dropping it into the chat box now uh, and uh, it's it's full of all the different um, ideas he's actually shared and uh, and we're welcome to share that as well um, Jono you've also produced a set an amazing set of coaching cards I'm just have you got them there with you because I I've left mine at home I was oh, playing with them last <laughs> night and I left them at home so um have you got them? I have don't. You got them? I, I, oh, I don't, sorry don't unfortunately. <laughs> I don't, unfortunately. But anyway, I'll let you finish. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So you've also offered um, offered people, um, you've also offered to, to give away um, a set of cards as well. So I we didn't actually talk about how we'd like to do this. How would you like to give away your, your set of coaching cards? By the way, everyone, um, the coaching cards, they're absolutely gorgeous. They're, they're basically the grow model, but laid out in a set of cards, which means you can just turn over the card. You don't have to think about um, a lot of, you don't have to think about the questions in advance. You can just turn over the next card. Um, I can tell you there's something that I would have loved to have come up with this, this idea. So um, they're really beautiful. We'll be able to um, share, share the link um, to your website where people can buy them as well. But how will we give away this set of cards? What would you like to do? Well, that's 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 a that's a good question, Natalie. Why don't, why don't we we'll check and see if anyone's been listening? All right. So let's, okay, great. Um, Thank you. How how about uh, how about if we um, share perhaps uh, or if people want to go to the chat box uh, and just type away their their response to uh, how 
they intend to take the learnings from, from this session today and apply it in their role as a coach or a people leader. So let's, uh, let's perhaps do it that way and let's see what, uh, what response we get. And so just whilst you're doing that, so how do you intend to take the, some of the key learnings from this session today and apply it in your role as a leader or, or, a, uh, uh, or a coach? Just to explain what Natalie's talking about uh, is, is uh, as, as leaders, uh, it's when we're being exposed to uh, coaching someone early on in our career and applying a coaching approach as a leader, often we spend an enormous amount of time just focusing on what is the next question I'm going to ask. And you're thinking, right, I'm in the grow start, I'm in the, in the G part of grow, or I'm in the R part, what's the next question I need to ask? And when you do that, it is almost impossible to stay curious for longer because you're not actually listening to what the individual is actually saying and then shaping your next question uh, around what it is that they're saying. So what I've done is, is developed uh, a series of or a pack of coaching cards. They're a little bit larger than a, perhaps a standard deck of coaching card, of uh, playing cards. And what, it, what they're designed to do is to help you as a coach or as a leader to actually remove the need to think about what the next question is because the cards you can place into four simple piles. One, uh, some grow questions, uh, some goal questions, reality questions, options and a way forward and you can turn them over one at a time with the coach or the direct report and actually ask that question that's there in front of them whilst you actually listen to the individual and perhaps shape another couple of questions and explore further with them you'll also see some instructions that are in there on how to actually apply it and at the end of it there's there's three or four uh, coaching cards that the coach or the direct report can take away with them which will actually enable them in that session to write down their goal write down some options that they're going to to, to go forward with and when they're actually looking to complete it uh, then what you can do is when you come back next time to the next conversation and you check in with them, for those of you that have been through Natalie's programs, you might be familiar with the ears model. And I use this to this day. It's brilliant. Uh, so you can link the previous conversation with the next one by using the ears acronym, which is elicit, amplify their achievements, reflect or restate what the objective is, and then start the conversation again around what they're actually going to do. So, so these coaching cards uh, are a fantastic way of being able to uh, not worry about the next question you're going to ask because they're there in front of you. Uh, and if you don't mind me saying this, Natalie, look, you, you can actually see what they look like uh, on my mm -hmm. website. So if you go to uh, www.jonathanmillan.com, uh, and in the uh, store section, you'll see there's like a little video, uh, there's a little uh, description of, of what it is. Uh, and as Natalie and I spoke about, uh, if you would like to, to purchase a pack of those, um, whilst I do sell those for $35, what I am happy to do is if you put in the coupon code open door, one word, <laughs> all lower, lower case, um, you can you can buy a set of those for, and I'll take ten dollars off those today. So they're twenty five dollars plus postage instead of thirty five, um, and you can and I'll send them out to you so you can have a look and play with them. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thanks for sharing it, Jono. And uh, as I said, I I got my uh, got my set of cards, and uh, I just love them. Very good for kinesthetic learners. Very good for tactile. So uh, rather than having the grow model there on a piece of paper in front of us, we've actually got it in the cards. We can. I, I actually did a bit of a shuffle of the cards too and pulled out a question. So I think you can use them in a lot of different ways as well. Like you can shuffle those cards pull out a question, you could open that, you could share that with your team as well. So thank you so much. Um, Jono, how do you want to decide? I, how, do you, how would you like to decide on, um, on, on who's the winner today? I'm thinking, um, you know, the eight, um, your, little, uh, your little clip there, stop, you know, pause for eight. Wait for eight, yes. Wait for eight, that's right. Should we go to the eighth person who answered the question? Would that, would that be helpful or? Okay, that's, <laughs> let's, let's see if we can. Um... Well, should we scroll there? Thank you everyone that, that's actually responded. Um, it's, <laughs> we should have worked this out beforehand. That's how you know that everything we do is live. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but if you're able to count up, um, Jono, um, who that winner might be, as you do that, I will put also into the chat box um, the CCEU certificate for today. 
And then uh, we're all sorted in terms of our, our paperwork as well. All right. Can you find the winner, do you think? All right. Um, All right. I tell you what. I, there's, there's two. There's two that stand out here, and what I'll do is I'll send one out to to both of them. Both of them. How's this? So Great. I like uh, Indabir Singh, who said I have uh, have my subordinates performance reports, midterm reporting coming up, and I'll be using the graph you presented on will and skill. I'll be utilising that to base my questions from Grow Model to stay curious. I like that one. No. Um, and the other one. I think Veronica Merry is you have a new starter who hasn't worked in a government context before. So very easy to, to default into the advice trap. And that is a classic example of uh, where you would fall into the, uh, it's easy to fall into the advice trap. And she finished off by saying, my challenge will be to ask what's on your mind more often than stay curious. So what I might get uh, into beer and Veronica to do is if you perhaps can email uh, Natalie, or, or open door your <laughs> yep. uh, address. I'll speak to Natalie and get those and I'll uh, shoot those cards out to you. Absolutely. And so email us at support at opendoorcoaching.com.au. And if anyone can't download Jono's document that he's given us today, a summary of his presentation, um, just email us at support.com.au. Um, so I think there was, uh, Alex Alexandra, if you can't if you can't access it, that's okay. Just send us a quick email. We'll flick that document to you as well. So, Jono, on behalf of everyone um, here today, thank you so much for giving us a masterclass in what is coaching and all of those extra ideas you had. Thank you for um, highlighting to us, even as very experienced coaches, that we need to watch out for that advice trap. Uh, we need to really be focused on our conversations. And you've given us all those little nuggets as well. So on behalf of everyone here and our partner, Synergy Global, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your time. And uh, for those of you, I'll just uh, stop the recording quickly.